Ken has had a uh, long and successful career as a professor, plant breeder in the Department of Agronomy. And a lot of people probably nationwide and maybe around the world know Ken for the work that he has done in clovers. And uh, in fact, I think clover is part, Ken, of your email address. It is my email address. That is your email address. And so we don't have a lot of clovers down here and Ken's commented about that sometimes in his career about uh, the impact he would have liked to have had on clovers in Central and South Florida. And uh, I look at Ken as the impact that he's had on lepograms. Most of the cows are Central and South Florida. And when I came here in 1998, the South Florida Beef Forage Program did a survey of producers. And I remember the number, 17% of the respondents said that they utilized Lymphograsses, the mockery of lymphograsses on their ranches. And more recently they did the survey and all but one, so 99% of them, said that they utilize lymphograsses on their pastures. Imagine what we would do today if it weren't for lymphograss in Central and South Florida and how we manage our calibers. It's an extremely important thing and, and, and part of our management systems. And Ken's work has been an important part of that even back in the early days and up till today. So I'm very appreciative of that, and that's what, what I want to do now is introduce uh, Dr. Ken Quisenberry. Well, good morning. Thank you for being here today. Um, it says I've got 30 minutes on this program. Hopefully I'll be a little more uh, concise than that, although some of my friends in the audience would probably suggest that concise is not part of my normal speaking uh, approach. Um, <clears throat> we're delighted you're here, <coughs> pardon me, uh, for this event. Uh, John is correct uh, in that uh, as I look back, oh, and by the way, I should tell you that I now live in <coughs> what's known as uh, a retired and rehired stage of life. Uh, and uh, in fact, I officially retired from the University of Florida after 35 years uh, in 2010, but for the last four years have been, had uh, various other uh, official and uh, working positions, uh, not the least of which is currently working with uh, two of my faculty colleagues, one of which is uh, Dr. Patricio Munoz, who is one of those LBR hires uh, and who's here with us this morning. Uh, trying to continue, finish up some of the work I did and, and perhaps help him get off on a, on a good footing uh, moving forward with uh, continuing the forage uh, breeding and development work. So I came to the University of Florida in 1975 and uh, when I walked in the door just about and met with Dr. Coleman Ward after they hired me, <coughs> I was told, uh, Ken, we've got this big collection of uh, Homothera altissima uh, plant introductions from South Africa and, and oh by the way there's three of them that have already been kind of distributed to the growers called Red Alta, Green Alta, and Big Alta uh, and we'd like you to kind of write up some official documentation on those and get that published and then we want you to sort through this other uh, 75 or 80 and see if there's something better because we think all three of those have some weaknesses that we we don't like and I said hmm, a Mothria, what? Uh, because I grew up in southern Kentucky on a little cattle ranch, and I thought I had studied my forage textbook really well, and I'd never heard of this plant before. Uh, <clears throat> but myself and uh, Dr. Bill Okapal, uh went to work evaluating that collection. We did publish a, 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 a IFAS uh, circular on those original three and got that documented. And <clears throat> shortly within about three or four years, had been through a preliminary evaluation of that large collection. Uh, and uh, Dr. Okapo and I at Gainesville uh, put out a grazing trial there at Gainesville. And then I think maybe the next year with uh, Paul Miss Levy, that same trial uh, here at Ona. And by the mid 80s, I think about 1984 officially, we had selected the one line out of that that became Floralta. <coughs> Excuse me. It was at that point that 
I kind of drifted back to working more with clovers and some of the uh, warm season legumes uh, and, and other activities in my program. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, I mean, I, I kept up with what was going on with limbo grasses, but I think it was along about where John uh, referred to, somewhere around 2000, that uh, we really kind of got the perspective all of a sudden that, uh, thank you, that the, uh, the large ranches uh, here in Central and South Florida had really changed your operations and how you were feeding cattle in the wintertime uh, using floralta and what that had meant to you. Uh, so perhaps if I look back, I need to go back and, and change my email address to lymphograss rather than clover uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the UF website. Uh, so that's just a, a little bit of background on uh, where I came from. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make uh, is uh, to recognize Ann Blunt over here uh, because really it was Ann that kept after me uh, being a cattleman as well as a researcher, she was going to that research committee meeting and, and I think Bert was kind of beating on Ann at some of those meetings about uh, getting back to doing some lymphograss grace work and, and she uh, had some funding and we hired a student to work with her uh, up at Mariana and these students spend a lot of their time at Gainesville so I became the uh, co-advisor for that student. And that student was working on Bahia grass and her new uh, Riata Bahia grass that was released about four years ago. Uh, she was working on the development. Carlos was involved in that and in some other work with Bahia grass. Uh, but at the same time, Ann said, uh, you know, we try to keep our students real busy when they're at games. And she said, well, Carlos, why don't you make a few crosses uh, between Floor Alta and Big Alta you don't have anything to do this winter while you're down there in Gainesville, you're just taking classes. And so Carlos got down the greenhouse and we got some, some of those plants and, and made those crosses. I had an email with Carlos uh, about two weeks ago and he kind of relayed to me some of the history and I won't go into a lot of that, but the bottom line of that was we had difficulty after he got the seed from those crosses uh, produced, he had difficulty getting them uh, all to grow and germinate. And he said, I literally took this bag of what wouldn't, hadn't germinated home and put it in the cabinet in Cory Village, the seed that didn't germinate, because when he first tried, nothing germinated. And he kept them over there. And he said, my wife asked me, can I throw these out? And he said, no, I'm just letting them age a little bit. And he brought them back and put them in the all germinated after just sitting around and aging. Well, that's not too unusual if we think about it, because seed often undergo a dormancy period. And when he brought those back, he got 53 plants out of that group uh, of seed. And <clears throat> they passed around to you a little handout. If you look on the, on the front of that handout, <coughs> excuse me. it says we had 53 progeny plants with, and so the way we make these crosses, we basically just put the two inflorescences together and put a bag around them and, and let them interpollinate. Uh, and so then you harvest the seed off of either floralta or big alpha. Well, as it turned out, the ones that we got, there were only 12 of those that had floralta as the mother, the female plant, and 31 of them had big alpha. Uh, those plants were grown uh, and how many of you have a picture of your grandchild or your child on your cell phone. <laughs> okay, most of you do, or on your mantle, right? Okay, well, we have pictures of those 53 sitting on a greenhouse bench in Gainesville in little pots about this big, when they were this, this big. So I have four elf and ten pictures of them sitting uh, on the greenhouse bench. We made cuttings and Carlos did some evaluations in the greenhouse. Pretty quickly we got those out in the small plots uh, at Gainesville and uh, here at Ona. And then the next year they went to Mariana uh, with Ann. Uh, and of those 53, after a couple of years, and this is where Bert was talking about, he saw them right up here and all that variability. And he's right, there was a tremendous amount of variability in that material. 
uh, all kinds of big ones and tall ones and spreading ones and, and various things. But after just two seasons of cutting those with a mower, we had pretty well settled down to about eight of those that look to us to have promise uh, for potential release. Uh, and it's that point is where then, uh, based on uh, Joe's data from here and our data from uh, Gainesville on the cutting and then Ann had data on disease response and other things from Mariana, uh, we put together kind of a matrix and, and figured out which ones of those we wanted to release. And they went into uh, some initial grazing experiments. If you flip over on the back of that page, you'll see some uh, couple of good looking people and an old gray haired fellow uh, standing in that uh, those small plots there at the top of the page. Uh, that's uh, Ann and Joe here and myself in the in the Gainesville trial of those initial uh, cutting evaluations. Uh, Dr. Sollenberger said, well let's get these moving forward because the one thing that we knew from the original work when I first came here is, uh, Bert, what was the main problem with uh, big apple? Well, it wouldn't persist. There you go. So if you grazed it very much, it died out. Okay? And, and the the attribute that we selected for in Floralto was persistence under grazing. Paul had it here, we had it at Gainesville, and grazed it heavy and hard, and it was the one that stood up and had good stand uh, under a reasonably rigorous grazing. Now, I think you can still say that limple grass is not the hair grass in terms of persistence of the grazing. Okay, you can you can overgraze limple grass still, but uh, that was what it was selected for. So, with Dr. Sollenberger and with Joe here, we knew that anything that we were going to consider for release had to have good persistence under grazing. And so, uh, Lynn then uh, put in some initial grazing trials at Gainesville uh, that had those eight uh, lines in it. And from that initial trial, even, we saw that 4F and 10 uh, had uh, a little better yield and persistence uh, and were actually out yielding Floralta, as you see there in that, those comments under the initial grazing trial. Uh, and uh, in Joe's work here, he had not picked 4F as one of the ones that looked as good in the small plot trials. Uh, so he had 10, uh, and it was still showing up well, and he had also picked selection number one, a hybrid number one out of that. Uh, and let me see, I think that's where I want to go. So go on to the advanced trials then. So uh, one 4 FM 32 and 34 plus Floralta as a comparison were planted in 2011. Uh, and uh, in a larger grazing trial with some uh, different levels of uh, grazing defoliation severity, if you will. Uh, and those went through that, both here and uh, at, uh, at Gainesville. Uh, first year, there weren't that many differences in response, but in the second year, again, one, four, up, and 10 were the ones that had uh, the highest uh, dry matter yields and 10 and 4F uh, were superior, certainly to Floralta in that uh, second year of evaluation. Uh, and were holding their cover. So it says they were 49 and 36% greater than Floralta. So they had a better stand after uh, four years, uh, after two years, excuse me. Okay, so we were pretty well settled there about a a year ago that these were the ones that we thought we wanted to go forward with, but we felt like we needed one other piece of data, and that other piece of data was how do these uh, lines hold up under stockpiling? Uh, Bert made the comment, and what's really revolutionized for many of you, the, uh, the winter feeding scenario for your beef cattle is that um, how many round balers do we have in South Florida these days? Not so many. Some, but not so many. Some people are making round bale silage and some other things, but, uh, you know, you really are depending much less on haymaking than on stockpiling forage. 
uh, for your operation. And so we knew that we needed to look at uh, these two lines uh, and how they respond uh, under that stockpiling scenario. Uh, and so Lynn had a, a, a student from uh, Southern Brazil, uh, Mr. Marcelo Wallow, who just finished um, the Christmas, yeah, this last Christmas, who in addition to the uh, advanced grazing trial at the various levels was looking at stockpiling uh, scenarios uh, with those uh, 1,4-F10 and floor alpha. And uh, so we have two years of data on that as well, where the plots were cut back in August, and, and for here in South Florida, August might be a little early when you'd want to start your stockpiling. You may go to mid-September or something like that, but think Gainesville. Uh, and uh, then fertilized with two levels of fertility and then looked at them for their quality and nutritive value at 8, 12, and 16 weeks uh, after that. Uh, and so you will see if you look on the back, now we'll get you to turn over on the back uh, and look at some of the data, uh, those uh, two grazing trials in figure two there show those hybrids at Gainesville and at Ona and uh, the fellow in the cowboy hat there I believe is, is Joe uh, and then the one picture and uh, the other the other caves there are at Gainesville so you can see in uh, figure one uh, the limple grass hybrids their yield and I think it's pretty obvious why we picked four up and ten uh, that kind of stand out clearly. That was that initial grazing trial, and then uh, one four F and ten also standing out uh, in the uh, advanced grazing trial. So we had those those involved in the study, and we had them in uh, the stockpiling study. Uh, my notes here say to me that uh, 4L had just a little bit better digestibility than 10, uh, but that's one data point, and I don't know that we want to make uh, a lot of inferences from that. Uh, that's under a stockpiling management. Uh, uh, I think Bert also made the, the proper comment uh, that uh, what do we know about lentil grass in terms of nutritive value and quality when stockpiled? Low protein. Low protein. Very good. We've got some smart people in this audience. Okay. And Bert's comment was, protein's not cheap, but it's cheaper than making hay. And, and, and so both of these, if you look at the, cro the crude protein data, uh, they're, they're going to be down there. And the, the digestibility is, you know, it certainly holds better than star grass or Bermuda grass or Bahia grass as it ages. Uh, in maturity, but it's it's not uh, you know it's not high digestibility material at that same point. But it has value for cow feed in a stockpile situation, and it really works better than than having to make hay. So that's what we were looking at, uh, and hopefully maybe both of these will be at least equal to, if not superior to uh, floor alpha in digestibility, and we're convinced that they are equal to, both of them are equal to, or better in persistence uh, compared to uh, floor alpha. Uh, Dr. Benjamini, the last paragraph there, uh, has had uh, some preliminary uh, animal performance studies uh, on comparing floor alpha with, uh, with number 10, and there were no differences uh, between them and uh, the uh, animal performance uh, weight gain study in the uh, first year of his grazing trial. And I believe you're continuing those this year, okay? Uh, so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I told you I was going to try not to go that 30 minutes, and I've only gone 15, and that's about all I want to say. Uh, I really wanted to reserve five or ten minutes uh, to engage in a bit of a dialogue with the audience 
uh, regarding what we've said and, and then perhaps some of your experiences uh, that might give us some additional directions for research, not necessarily for new varieties, because we think these two may be fill the bill, but for some things that you would like to see us be looking at in terms of research data or management type data that might benefit you and your cattle operations. So uh, you've heard the comments I've made. Uh, I would ask you, do you have some, some thoughts uh, along that line? Yes, sir. Do you, uh, did you evaluate chinch bug damage on that big alder of the cross because that was a problem back when they were there? Uh, have we seen uh, chinch bugs on big alder? Um, no. Now we have had some spill bug issues that show up sometimes. Lynn? I was just saying, a number of years ago in Indianville, we definitely had chinch bugs also on four alders. Mm -hmm. uh, during the evaluation, and Joe can comment about about Ono, but during the evaluation, I did not detect any chinch bug issues. But that doesn't mean they're not there. It simply means that we didn't yeah. see them during the, the course of evaluation. Joe, you want to comment on any chinch bug issues with any of these that you saw during the evaluation period here? Um, I didn't. I didn't see it mainly because we kept it really short. When we were grazing or harvesting, it was always short. But we did a stop filing work last year on the pastures that we were grazing. But again, I didn't see any problem in the Colalta or the number ten or the the gig grass. Uh, but again, I stopped filing in October, and by that time, the pseudo bugs and pink bugs they are pretty much gone. I think if you're gonna see some problems, that there will be right now. You still have a breath that's pretty soft, but I haven't seen anything. Yes, sir? Well, I've had some still bugs problems and also our more problems, and, you know, right after you fertilize. Yep, yep. And um, you have to watch it real closely. But my question is, um, so if you have an existing Floralta pasture, right, and you're growing it for, for forage or for hay, mm -hmm. Um, and you want to introduce this newer grass, can it just be scraped in just like anything else, or do you got to kill the floral? Or what? How, how do you introduce it in without? You know, what's the best way to do that? Mm, what do you manage with those for cyclists? I, I guess my comment would generally be, I certainly would not recommend you going in and ripping up a floral pasture to plant one of these. That's good to hear. Uh, no, no, uh, too much cost and expense and reestablishment and these are not that much better than Floralta to justify that I don't think. Uh, if you have a Floralta pasture that you've abused and has gotten to be mostly sedges and water grass and uh, smut grass and, and you're ready to renovate that pasture anyway, uh, maybe grow a crop of vegetables for a, a, a winter time and get your land cleaned up and, and, and then then go in with one of these would be my approach to that. I, I, I don't think I'd try to rip up some strips unless you have, you know, if you have an area that's died out, you want to just, you know, disc clean up an area and do a spot of this in the floral pasture, that should work fine. But just spreading it in, no, I don't think I'd want to try that. What, <clears throat> what variety from Muckland was high moisture? Right, for muckland with high moisture. Uh, you, uh, one of the things that scientists are often reluctant to do is to make recommendations beyond the data points that we have on the curve. And, and we don't have those data points on our curve. So we don't have a, uh, other than Belglade, we don't have a uh, research center on muckland. And so I haven't seen this thing growing on muckland, but uh, my, my general experience, and this goes back to 1976, when I first arrived, they were growing some big alta at Belle Glade, and it looked terrific. I don't think you could, you could go wrong with either one of these on Muckland. I mean, the attribute that Amatria has over any of our other grasses is it'll grow in standing water. It's perfectly happy uh, in standing water as long as it keeps its uh, heads above the, the water. Uh, so you can have two or three inches of standing water and it'll grow right along quite happily. 
one's no better than the other. Um, as I said, I don't have that data point, but to the best of my knowledge, not. Florella is just as good. Uh, again, I wouldn't rip up my Florel to the plant one of these unless I had a poor stand of Florel. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. What pH is best? Okay. The pH of the soil is best. I believe we are, the target pH recommendations on the IFRS recommendations are 5.5. Five. Okay, that's what I, I believe. So 5.5, five, if you're below 5.5, five, consider liming. Five five or above, we do not recommend a lot. And my second question is, did I understand you correctly that when you said like to harvest it, to stockpile, or to put in a tub grinder to make feed, that it, it, it was only a ten, it was a ten percent protein? Did I understand that? Oh, I, I'd say if you had ten percent protein on twelve week old stuff, you must have put on a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. <laughs> Uh, it's probably closer to six or seven at six or seven. ten or twelve weeks old, maybe even five. Okay. I mean, when when you're up there at the twelve to to, to sixteen weeks old, the crude protein is going to be pretty low. What this grass will do above almost any of our other grasses <coughs> is, uh, I've said this to a lot of people, it will put together a lot of carbon. It will fix a lot of stuff to grow with with very little nitrogen added to it. But when you do that, what you've got is a lot of carbon with very little nitrogen, i.e. crude protein in it. And so it'll grow a lot of grass with not too much nitrogen, but the product you get is a lot of grass with not too much crude protein in it. Okay, first. That, the plant that I, that I harvested, the big off that I harvested and took up there for the crawl, uh -huh. I picked it out of, uh, about 18, it was standing in the 18 inches of water on muckland that the state is taking from. Okay. Yep. Okay. Good point. Somebody else over here. Mr. Kemper or somebody had a question? Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Now, you got your crosses from seed, but we always propagate by spreading. If seed is not a reasonable propagation. So if you look at those little seed heads on limpo grass when it gets real old and stemmy. It looks kind of like, uh, not even, it's been more like a pencil lead, something maybe like the, the, the ink pen filler in a, in a ballpoint pen. It's about that size and there are little seeds kind of embedded in the side of that, six or eight or ten of those little seeds. And, and so to get those, A, to get them threshed and clean and so forth, you're basically sitting down with a pair of tweezers and a uh, picking them out of that, so the bottom line is no. Uh, is, uh, that's a good, good job for a graduate student to, to do and to get some crosses, but it's not the way we would ever envision trying to propagate this thing to see it just as uh, we don't consider that to be feasible. Uh, before I sit down, Ann, is there anything I missed? You just need to ask them what else is on their laundry list for us to work on. Yeah. Well, I think we know that laundry list. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the cattlemen, the research committee has, has made that pretty clear, and Dr. Gilbert and, and, and Dr. Arlington have looked at that, and we're looking at prioritizing that. Joe, any more comments? Uh, how, this, far north, how far north in the state do y'all anticipate this being functional? In the state, wetlands all the way to Escambia County, and we're putting it in in Escambia County this year. So. All the way. So here's the difference. Uh, Mr. Kemper, this red, uh, Bert, the folks from here on south, how many uh, freeze events where you're at, say, 25, do you get on average a year? This center averages three events a year that we reach 32 degrees since we've been here. 32. How many do you get where you hit 25? Do you have that data point? No, Less than three. Less than three. <laughs> Less than three. Okay. Uh, two years ago at the uh, dairy unit in Gainesville, we had 18, 32 or below events. Okay. And that's the difference. I, it took me about 15, 20 years to figure out that that's the real difference in terms of forage production, I-4 south and I-4 north. 
and that's not a solid cutoff, but but you really don't. And, and as Bert very clearly said, you can get that 28, 26, 25 degree night, and you'll get a little browning on the leaves, it'll turn purple, tops of the stems may be dead. Five, seven, ten days of warm weather, a little water that came with that freeze event, and you got green grass growing again. At Gainesville, the problem is before we get that next seven to ten days, we've had another one of those freeze events, and we have about four of those, and then it begins, limpel grass begins to look more like bahag grass in terms of its frost response. It will stockpile for us up till about Christmas, tip of the year, maybe into January, but somewhere there in January, February you're not going to have the value for stockpiling. I think it'll still be productive for the other uses of it, but to figure that, it, that you're not going to have to make hay in Escambia County is probably, uh, Ann can tell you, she farms in Gaston County, it's, it's going to, you're going to have to make hay still. For winter grazing. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to make hay or graze something in the wintertime. Yes? Are there any lagoons, summer or winter, that work well for the so the gentleman sitting right behind you did his uh, PhD thesis at Gainesville on mixing uh, common ashenomony with lentil grass. Uh, and probably those two plants are best, will work best together on the soils where lentil grass is best adapted uh, in Central South Florida. Ashenomony certainly has its limitations in terms of getting it established, and if you've got rank and vigorous lymphal grass, it's probably not going to get ashenomony in with it. So it's when you when you've overgrazed your lymphal grass and it gets thinned out a little bit, then you might get some some pretty good stand of ashenomony in it. So, uh, yes. From standpoint, uh, Ann's comment about uh, weather type land in huh? our area here, you know, we might have a 10 or 20 acre block that's got four different soil types in it. Yeah. Real wet to real dry. What does it look like as far as the drier type land? I know used to with some of the hermophagus there was this problem with nematodes on the drier type land and all. Did we see that same type of deal on the drier land? Um, I would make the same comment I did about the extremely wet muck soil. I'm not sure we have that data point in our evaluations at this point, but I would not expect it to perform any differently than Floralta or the others. Uh, so one you, of the, you would definitely stay to the wetter type. I soil. would definitely stay on the wetter type soils. We are, uh, two of the folks who are getting the initial planting material for distribution are the Rooks Brothers up in the Brookville area, and they're going to the wettest site they have, but it's still probably drier than a lot of this land. And then some of the planting, uh, as we go up to the Panhandle, may get that, so we may get some of that data, but I wouldn't expect this to perform any nematodes particularly. Uh, can be an issue on lentil grass. Can all the all the lentil grass accessions at Mariana have been dry land since '05, uh, dry soils, and they've survived. We haven't had a whole lot of disease problems either. But I think management is what took out a lot of the lentil grass that was planted when Ken first released the lentil grasses in the Panhandle because I can still find remnants in some of the fields around where lymphograss was planted. So I think it went out maybe in part because of management and mismanagement. It's the single biggest management issue overgrazing it. I think so. <laughs> it's the single biggest management issue overgrazing. Graze lymphograss like the hairgrass, you'll have the hairgrass. <laughs> okay. Good coming. I second that. How does 4F compare to Big Alpha as far as uh, palatability? Uh, I don't know that we have palatability, digestibility. No digestibility. Uh, not much different in our studies. 4F has, of, of the two that we're releasing, 4F has been higher digestibility than can and I I'm sorry I'm still using the numbers and not the names but at any rate you, you have numbers on here the 4F which is the one that's going to be called Ken High uh, 
has been higher in digestibility, but I mean, you know, it, it's a lymphograss. Um, it's probably more like big alta than it is like floor alta in terms of digestibility, but in terms of persistence under grazing, it's been consistently better than even floor alta. So, uh, you know, the reality is that, that you guys are going to, when you plant this stuff out and get it on scale, on farm, you're going to learn things about it that we don't yet know. Um, you know, we, the, the time period from when Ken bred this stuff to when it's released is probably about as short as we can put that process together. Ever. And, and in order to get that to you relatively quickly, you simply can't look at every possible scenario. So we've compared it against floor alpha in settings in, in a number of different locations throughout the state under different grazing wow. and stock plowing managements. And those two have consistently come up better. But you guys are going to be the real test. And that's always the case. I mean, you know, you turn one of your kids loose, uh, you'll find out how good a job you did, you know, a couple years down the road. Likewise with these, uh, we'll figure out how, how good a job we did uh, based on uh, how well it performs under your conditions. But don't graze the heck out of it and then come back and tell us we screwed up. Because I'll tell you right now that if you do that, you're going to kill it, so don't bother. All right? The, the final comment I would make, and I'll, I'll get to your question. The final comment I would make is I want to thank my colleagues and and uh, others who were involved in this uh, process. This really was a team effort, and as Lynn said, we went through this about as quick as you could ever expect to take a, a grass from a, a little seed sitting in the greenhouse to to a release variety. And then the other thing is at the suggestion of a couple of my colleagues. Uh, the Ken High name happens to be uh, my name. You might have noticed that as well. So that's where that name came from. And we have one more question. Where do you get it? Uh, Joe and John were going to talk to you a little bit about that. Okay. <laughs> Good job. That was an excellent discussion, and it's right on time. We are at 11 o'clock. Uh, we're going to go on a tour now and take you out to the pastures where these grasses are growing here at Ona. And uh, the question that you had about where to obtain the grass, uh, I just spoke to Dr. Vendermini before I came up here, and he's going to go over that with everybody out there as part of that discussion. And uh, any other questions that you might have or think of in terms of management of this grass, uh, we'll ask the experts while we're out there, okay? And then... We're going to come back here after that tour, have lunch here under the tent, and uh, I think all the individuals will be here. So as we go on throughout uh, the rest of the morning, feel free to, to uh, address any questions that, that you might have.